Here's a few exciting scenes from tonight's episode of The Tom Gully Show. Uh, I came across just the title and the description, and I frankly expected something far more lowbrow that you might see in your uncle's bathroom next to the 10,000 bathroom joke (laughs) book. Somebody must have done a book of photographs and text about bathrooms, but nobody had. I mean, it's pretty unusual to find something that hasn't been done before. I was blown away by this book. I was stunned at how eloquent and artful and observational it was. The photography is simply stunning and and wonderfully observational as well. What in the world made you want to explore this subject? I've done a lot of traveling in the course of many photo assignments and uh, produced a number of books. I've done two books, for example, uh, different aspects of America. And intermittently, I'd come across an interesting bathroom and I'd photograph it. <clears throat> and I, I kind of got interested in it. It became like a theme or a project. And when I showed people the pictures I had taken, they just really reacted on a on a really kind of profound emotional level. And I realized there was something about the subject of bathrooms that grab people more than other subjects. Bathrooms are kind of the secret room. And and we don't like talking about secrets, but we want to learn about them, you know? We yeah. want to see what other people's bathrooms are like, and we want to learn what goes on in there. If a person takes a lot of pride in their bathroom, they want you to come in and photograph it. You know, nobody ever said, don't come. <laughs> Once I made a connection, it's like, sure, hey. It's my pride and joy. Yeah, know? yeah. And the way I find I found them is I do a huge amount of uh, public speaking. And during the course of my talks to these uh, various groups, I would mention in passing that I was working on this book. And if anyone knew a really unusual bathroom, I wanted to know about it. And after every talk, people would come up. Sometimes there'd be a short line of, you know, several people. And they would give me names, locations, email addresses. They would make connections for me so I could get access to some of these really stupendous and distinctive bathrooms. Yeah. Well, I have one for you. Uh, I used to be the editorial director for the Cartoon Network. And at the Cartoon Network, uh, the walls are decorated with cells from famous cartoons. But when (laughs) when you go into the bathroom... First of all, you open the door, and the very first cell you see is from an episode of Johnny Quest, and Dr. Quest is holding a beaker that has a green gaseous fume coming out of it, and the others are recoiling. And then when you go in above all of the urinals and in in the actual stool areas, there are equally pertaining to bathroom-type humor cells above all of those, uh, all of those various... Facilities. Okay. Well, Tom, Tom, I'm taking notes. So for my next book, there, <laughs> I hope that Flush Two will somehow, you know, happen. In my book, it's really interesting stuff, like the history of toilet paper. What did we use, you know, before there was toilet paper? Uh, there, it's just, it's a whole world. It's Look, whole the world. the the, whole, the uh, history culture. the history of toilet paper section of your book alone is worth the purchase price. I mean, I, I, <laughs> do you fall either direction on this? Which way does on, the on toilet, the over under? I well, mean, I do. it's gonna I do. it's gonna it's gonna crack our society in the middle. You know, when they find the, I, <laughs> the yeah, well, when they find the rubble of our society post-apocalyptic, like Planet of the Apes, they'll figure out it was this toilet paper thing. How much giggles and snickers did you have to put up with, sort of, while doing this? Oh, quite a bit, quite a bit. It always gets a snicker when you, you know, when I would tell people what I was doing. In fact. The, the snicker factor is pretty high. You know, say you go to a bartender, uh, which I would do, and I'd say, any unusual bathrooms around here? And, of course, the first reaction is, you're pulling my leg, you know? But then you say, I'm a photographer, and I'm working on a book. And then they get totally engaged in a conversation with you. It, just, it comes out of nowhere, and it's so refreshing and surprising. Where is there a bathroom 
with with graffiti. And lo and behold, you know, ask and ye shall receive. <laughs> Someone came to me and said, there is a bathroom near the inner harbor of Baltimore where the graffiti is so spectacular, they preserve it as if it's like art on the wall. There were so many great ones. You know, you mentioned right. the Las Vegas bathroom. That was great. But so was George Washington's outhouse. That blew me away, too. Uh, the the one in Vegas, that opulent, just spectacular. Oh, I I don't know if I could go in that bathroom. It's too nice. It, you know what I mean? There, yes, yes. There is a there is a feeling like it would be like going to the bathroom in a the room of a museum. And I don't know whether I should you know uh, give give the results. Maybe sure. You're, I, listeners well, can ponder. Well, they, whatever you ponder like. What I, <laughs> I have no problem torturing my listeners with this program. Uh, <laughs> do it every episode. Due to some violent content, parental discretion is advised. It's time, America. Mr. and Mrs. North of South America, all the ships at sea, let's go to press. So sit back, buckle in, place your tray table in its upright lock position, and get ready for big time radio, friends. It's time for It is Thursday, March 26, 2015, episode 239. I'm Tom Gully, and tonight on The Tom Gully Show, interesting people saying interesting things. That's the standard of The Tom Gully Show, and I am always, always, always on the prowl for just that, you know, in order to bring you the staggering cornucopia of eclectic topics that we warm up and, you know, present to you like a TV dinner. So when I saw there was a guy with a book about bathrooms, you know, toilet areas and such, I was naturally thrilled because I'm a guy that eats a lot of brisket. But I expected a book filled with hee-haw level observations and illustrations and such. But what I got was frankly a surprisingly unexpected and incredible book of history, lore, legend, uh, wit, and downright eloquence. Uh, Steve Gottlieb is a recognized photographer with several books under his belt, but this one shows off his staggering photographic talent along with some absolutely masterful storytelling. Get it now at Amazon.com or Steve's own website, GottliebPhoto.com. Talented photographer and author Steve Gottlieb takes us on a journey into the world of bathrooms and his extremely interesting book, Flush, Celebrating bathrooms past and present tonight on the Tom Gully Show. You're listening to the Tom Gully Show. You'll find our snack bar chock full of good things to eat and drink. Tasty, tempting hot dogs, thirst-quenching soft drinks, fresh, crunchy popcorn. You've plenty of time, so visit the snack bar now. Just send an email to tom at the tomgullyshow.com. We're happy to be speaking with Steve Gottlieb, author and photographer of a great book, Flush, Celebrating Bathrooms Past and Present. Welcome to the program, sir. Good to be here, Tom. Hey, you know, I got to tell you, it's time for me to tell the long-winded story of why I was, you know, thrilled uh, at the opportunity to talk to you about this book. Uh, I came across just the title and the description and I frankly expected something far more lowbrow that you might see in your uncle's bathroom next to the 10,000 bathroom joke book. I, will right, right. I was blown 
away by this book. I was stunned at how eloquent and artful and observational it was. The photography is simply stunning and, and wonderfully observational as well. What in the world made you want to explore this subject? Well, uh, f- first, thanks for your, your remarks and observations. Uh, I got into this kind of, I backed into it. <clears throat> I've done a lot of traveling in the course of many photo assignments and uh, produced a number of books. I've done two books, for example, uh, different aspects of America. And intermittently, I'd come across an interesting bathroom and I'd photograph it. <clears throat> and I I kind of got interested in it. It became like a theme or a project. And when I showed people the pictures I had taken, they just really reacted on a, on a really kind of profound emotional level. And I realized there was something about the subject of bathrooms that grabbed people more than other subjects. And I think it, it has to do with a couple of things. One is bathrooms are kind of the secret room. And, and we don't like talking about secrets, but we want to learn about them, you know. We want to yeah. see what other people's bathrooms are like, and we want to learn what goes on in there. And, um, and the other thing is we, people don't actually see very many pictures of bathrooms. It's not, it's not a popular subject. In fact, you weren't even allowed Hollywood code, I think, through the 1960s to even show a bathroom in a movie. Violence? Yes, a certain amount of sex, yes, but not bathrooms. That was, um, you know, considered uh, too, I don't know, whatever the word is. You it, know. It's, it's really, str- uh, it's a strange. Inappropriate. You know? Yeah, it's it's because it's, it's titillating and it's, but everybody does it. It's a it's a really unique thing. We had the, one of the most legendary moments in television history was the first toilet flush sound uh, on All in the Family. <laughs> and, you know, who, right. who can't. You know, who, who can't forget that? Uh, now, you got into the history of this, which is another thing about the writing in the, the book is excellent because it's like part history. And then you'll take kind of a little side road and, and point out one little aspect of the bathroom. I mean, right down to the guys that that figure out waste management and disposal. Uh, when did the earliest bathrooms exist and what the heck did people do before that? Uh, did they just have a place in the woods? Uh, how did the bathroom become sort of a, a structure or a place? Well, obviously, people used the woods originally, and that was, you know, before there was writing, yeah. there was going to the bathroom. You know, <laughs> it came with the territory of being human or being any kind of a, a living, living being. Uh, I believe the first known bathrooms we're a couple of thousand years BC, and uh, a lot of the earliest uh, archaeological finds were in the Persia area, Iran, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, and so forth, areas that now are in the news. But they were where we've uncovered the first signs of bathrooms, the first signs of really organized bathrooms, in other words, not just a, a hole but a place where there were multiple holes and uh, running water, at least back then there was running water, were in Roman times. And I have not uh, seen the bathroom in Turkey, but I've seen uh, photographs of it. And there are at least nine or ten holes lined up, just one after another. You know, now we, we expect complete privacy in our bathrooms. Back then... And even through the the 1800s, people didn't expect privacy, even into the 1900s in outhouses. Well, and they had no expectation of privacy. That that stuns me. And that's I mean, and I grew up in Indiana, so I had seen a two holder or a three holder on an old farm or something. But I never stopped to think until I read your book. That that was actually for three people at once. I I you know I don't know what I was thinking. I thought maybe everybody had their own or something. I uh, but in your book you explain yeah, and that made me so it, it does it makes me a little uncomfortable just the thought. Well, you can explain the concept. Right. It's it's you're sitting right next to another person. I want at least a three foot foot wall of cement or something around me. I mean, 
uh, the, no. the, 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 but the old, especially, and you mentioned the Western days, it, it was quite common. Yeah, it, it shows how culture can change over time. What we take for granted now was not only not taken for granted, but it was a complete different way of doing it. One of the bathrooms, and by the way, like you, when when I first saw a big outhouse and I knew there was more than one hole, I didn't stop to think, well, what actually does that mean? What went on there? But I remember I went down to Mount Vernon, George Washington's home. He was something of an amateur architect, and he, in fact, designed his own outhouse. So there's this outhouse right outside the home uh, at Mount Vernon, and there are three holes. And I have, have not been able to shake the idea of George pants down, sitting on one of those holes, and then having his friends there talking, you know, like affairs of state while they're going to the bathroom. It's it's kind of a strange <laughs> strange yeah. way of viewing the father of our country, but that's the way it was. It's unnerving to me, but uh, now the concept of the bathhouse, uh, this, this goes like from one end of the spectrum to the other because some of the bathhouses were quite opulent <laughs> and, and uh, actually very, very you yeah. know, spectacular. I only got to photograph one, and it was on the south shore of, uh, of Queens in an area called Rockaway. And it uh, was hit by a, a hurricane, so it's boarded up now, but, uh, but I'm familiar with it. It's very elegant, a, a beautiful thing, beautiful piece of architecture. And, of course, there have been bathhouses since, you know, at least Roman times. And then starting around the 1950s or 60s, they became associated with homosexual meeting places. And back then, that was, you know, the society disproved of that, so it resulted in the closing of all the bathhouses, at least all the bathhouses in America. Um, and, you know, one day they'll, I hope, you know, reopen or, or create some uh, because they used to be cultural centers in a way, you know, places where you would go, like you go to a country club now and play golf, well, you know, you would go to a bathhouse and you would sit around in a pool and so on. There would be bathrooms and showers um, and and you would congregate together. Now, what do you think separates like a public bathroom from a residential one? You know, I, I because you can go into a, a bathroom in any office building in the United States and you wouldn't know what what building you were in unless you you know, had walked in the front of it. it. They're, they're identical and they're, and they're super impersonal. Uh, when you go to someone's home, it's, it's almost an expression of who they are to a certain extent, you know, that that's one of the things that, that I found most interesting in working on the book. And, and I think that's one reason people would enjoy the pictures because most houses do have pretty mundane looking bathrooms, but there are a lot of exceptions, and people do see it as a as an expression of their own aesthetics, their own you know kind of artistic uh, flair, and consequently, there are some bathrooms that are absolutely spectacularly distinctive, artistic, but totally unusual. And the way I find I found them is I do a huge amount of uh, public speaking. And during the course of my talks to these uh, various groups, I would mention in passing that I was working on this book. And if anyone knew a really unusual bathroom, I wanted to know about it. And after every talk, people would come up. Sometimes there'd be a short line of, you know, several people. And they would give me names, locations, email addresses. They would make connections for me so I could get access to some of these really stupendous and distinctive bathrooms and I just I love seeing them and of course if a person takes a lot of pride in their bathroom they want you to come in and photograph it you know nobody ever said don't come <laughs> once I made a connection it's like sure hey it's my pride and joy yeah yeah well I have one for you uh I used to be the editorial director for the Cartoon Network. And at the Cartoon Network, uh, the walls are decorated with cells from famous cartoons. But when you go, right. okay. when you go into the bathroom, 
first of all, you open the door, and the very first cell you see is from an episode of Johnny Quest, and Dr. Quest is holding a beaker that has a green gaseous fume coming out of it, and the others are recoiling. And then when you go in above all of the urinals and in in the actual stool areas, there are equally pertaining to bathroom-type humor cells above all of those uh, all of those various facilities. Okay. Well, Tom, Tom, I'm taking notes. So for my next book, uh, <laughs> I hope that flush two will somehow uh, t- you know happen. Uh, we've yeah. got to sell flush one. Right. But if that uh, if that happens, then um, then I'm I'm hitting the road again because I have been getting more uh, ideas for places to go since the book came out. And so I've got quite a collection now of uh, index cards, you know, with places to go. Well, now the tra- and it's a big world. And, and <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say it's a big world and some of the variety, uh, particularly in, in Japan. Japan is, is like the center of advanced bathroom technology. So I'm dying to go to Japan and photograph some of the features that they have in their bathrooms. It, it would amaze you. Uh, I know about it from reading and seeing pictures, but I have not been there personally and done my own photographic uh, take on it. Now, how much did you learn about toiletries or the trappings of the bathroom, you know, shampoo and cologne and all the other things? Did, did those move indoors or were they outdoors to make it smell better? Or um, Well, I'm, I'm hardly an expert. I mean, I am, after all, a photographer. You know, I'm not a... Right. Uh, a bathroom designer or a water engineer or a plumber or anything like that. But I can tell you that the more I got into learning about bathrooms, the more fascinated I became, which is why I put quite a bit of text in in my book. It's really interesting stuff, like the history of toilet paper. What did we use, you know, before there was toilet paper? Uh it's just, it's a whole world. It's Look, the history of toilet paper section of your book alone is worth the purchase price. I mean, I, I, <laughs> the, 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 the whole toilet paper concept, I think, fascinates yeah. people. Do you fall either direction on this? Which way does on, the toilet... On the over-under? I well, mean, I do. it's gonna, I do. it's gonna, it's gonna crack our society in the middle, you know. When they find the, I, <laughs> the yeah, go ahead. well, when they find the rubble of our society <laughs> post-apocalyptic, like Planet of the Apes, they'll figure out it was this toilet paper thing. Uh, it's it's amazing. I actually had not given it a lot of thought, other than to say, uh, when I when I met my uh, my wife to be she did it one way and I did it the other and, and neither of us thought the other, the other person's way made much sense. But I, I have to say I'm a pretty smart guy. I just did it her way. That's I, a sign of, of maturity in a guy, you know, that you don't would, fight, you don't debate, you just do it. That's correct. So I did it. But, <laughs> but then when I started to work on the book, I started asking people what their preference was. And not only is it not 50-50, it's, there's nothing random about it, but people have incredibly strong feelings. And there have been several surveys done about preference. And I don't know whether I should, you know, uh, give, give the results. Maybe sure. your, your I, listeners well, can ponder. Well, they, whatever you like. What I, might be. <laughs> I have no problem torturing my listeners uh, with this program. Uh, <laughs> do it every episode. But... I, I have a belief in that regard, but I don't care. I it just it's the last thing that I care about. But I've seen people go, you know, tooth and claw over this toilet paper thing. Um, yeah. Some of the some of the stuff. So you, I have to say, that's the smallest minority. In other words, there's those who do over, those who do under, and then there's a sl- kind of a small group that say, who, who cares? Uh, but that's you know, I, I think that might be ten percent or less of the I don't care. Wow, I've I've always belonged to the fringe group. Um, toy, the, I I find it interesting that it was first mass produced in the 14th century, um, and that 1857 was the uh, first appearance of it here in the United States. 
Wow. Right. And it took a while before it got to uh, being on rolls. You know, the Scott Paper Company early on figured out that it would be more efficient putting it on rolls than having uh, uh, sheets like Kleenex, you know, that come out one at a time. Well, there's a Western. Once they, once they discovered that. Yeah, go ahead. Well, there's a, a, a Western with Robert Duvall in it. I, I forget the name of it because he's in like three movies that are almost identical. But he purchases <laughs> what he calls or what are called at the time therapeutic papers. And then it was to- it was it was toilet paper is what it was used for, but it was it was called therapeutic papers, and he he would carry them around, and the other cowboys made fun of him because they of course were using the legendary corn cob or you know leaves or whatever they had locally. Right. Uh, right. Most people have not stopped to think what was used before toilet paper, and you've mentioned two you know two things: corn cobs and leaves. But unless you're in have lived in farm farm country, uh, you wouldn't ever think of using a corn cob. And of course, some people are aware that that the most popular thing in the later outhouse years was the Sears catalog because it had a vast number of individual sheets that you could tear out, and the ink didn't smear too much. So uh, people like using that. Yeah. Well, it's probably uh, why Sears isn't doing as well now. Uh, you know, <laughs> people aren't spending. I never as much, thought of it that way. People aren't spending as much time. Uh, the criteria. Uh, I find it interesting that the criteria uh, Consumer Reports uses is soft softness, strength, disintegration, tearing, ease. Do you uh, do you do you have any thoughts on the ply issue? Well, actually, I do, but I wouldn't say there are super strong uh, feelings about it. But one ply, which you get in a lot of um, oh, restaurants, hotels, and so on, you, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me because you got to, you know, just use a lot more of it. <laughs> so two ply makes makes some more sense. I, I can't quite fathom three ply, but they do make such stuff. And one of the things I learned is the number of different kinds of toilet paper. You know, you have one, two, and three ply, and then they have various levels of, like, softness, absorbency, lotion in them. And now there was an article just, I think, in the past week in either the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal about premium toilet paper. For people, whatever your income, you could afford to splurge and get the highest end Toilet paper. So this is the growth area in the toilet paper industry. People want to get, you know, the primo toilet paper. Rock. I'm not sure if I'm going out to buy it, but uh, <laughs> you know, rock you know, star. A lot of people are. It's <laughs> rock star toilet so paper. Uh, you know, <laughs> I had a uh, friend that had the lotion kind, and that's just that drives yeah. you crazy because you never. It's like, am I done here? I'm all lotioned up now. I, I, I wasn't crazy about that. How, how much on that topic, how much giggles and snickers did you have to put up with sort of while doing this? Oh, quite a bit, quite a bit. It always gets a snicker when you, you know, when I would tell people what I was doing. In fact, the, the snicker factor is pretty high. So, you know, I'm a graduate of a major law school. I practice law from number of years before I became a photographer and each time I publish a book I would notify my college and my law school you know that Steve Gottlieb has done another book sure I haven't told them about this one I, <laughs> I just the snicker factor among the lawyers I mean the people I graduated graduated with you know some years ago they're lawyers uh, you know senior partners of law firms and judges and congressmen and so on <laughs> And then to have one of the one of their number be the bathroom photographer, it's, I don't know. I'm having trouble with it. So maybe uh, maybe at some point I'll let them know that I've done the book. But yeah, snicker factor very high. But once people get into the book, they realize that they're as fascinated as as I am. You know, and it, it, there's no more snickers. There's some laughter for sure, and it's it's something of a funny subject. Mostly it's like a secret thing. And people want to know, but they don't want to ask. 
it's there there's an element of re- repressed humor or that you know you want to laugh it's a it's a it's a little bit funny uh but but at the same time you know especially here in the United States we've been kind of taught to let's just not talk about that let's let's just kind of yeah. keep it under the surface i have to say i was it's was just an, a wonderfully pleasant surprise your book it 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 came at me from a direction I did not ever expect. It's like a, a spectacular coffee table book. If that's a, I don't, I don't mean that as an insult. I mean, it's just something you can sit there and page turn. Uh, I loved the writing. I thought that the amount of text was perfect. And the photography is just stunning. It's the kind of, it's just the half photojournalism, half art, stark, perfect document that I find irresistible. What, from a photography standpoint, was your direction or artistic theme throughout this? Did something guide you, or did you just follow your muse and do what you always do as a photographer? Well, I can tell you what my what my muse is. People who do photo books, I have one kind of general criticism, <clears throat> pardon me, which is they tend to have a style and they they bring that style to each situation. And I find that I get bored if I'm looking at different subjects, but, but photograph the same way. And very often the subjects are very similar. So what I tried to do was find as many completely different kinds of bathrooms. I mean, obviously they all have, you know, one thing in common. It's a place to go to the bathroom. But within that, you know, commonality, the variety was amazing, and then I just tried to approach it so that the reader would not get bored looking at all these pictures of what you might think is the same subject. And so I bring a different sense of composition and a different sense of lighting uh, to all those, uh, you know, to each uh, to each situation. And I try to give it, you know, a little flair, a little flair. And of course, most people who, you know, who take Pictures, even when they do interiors, they don't they don't do a lot of bathrooms. So the subject itself is, is kind of fresh to people. I mean, I was stunned when I first got the idea to do the book. It, kind of the light bulb went off. I went online. I looked in Amazon. I looked in Google, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and I plugged in every keyword imaginable to see somebody must have done a book of photographs and text about bathrooms, but nobody had. I mean, it's pretty unusual to find something that hasn't been done before. Sure, sure. But this and, has not. Oh, my gosh. This this needs to be on the, you know, uh, counter of every high-end bathroom and kitchen faucet place in the world. I mean, it's just, it, it you, you really spectacularly succeeded in making the book very diverse in the look of the photography because you do have people and you go from a, as rustic of an outhouse as you can get with lighting and, and uh, you know, exposure that, that would be fit that to that absolutely spectacular bathroom in Las Vegas. Yes, right. It, Which is where I'm going in a few weeks. It, yes, I'm going to go back and visit the bathroom and show them the book. In the photo, I think I sent them a copy when the book came out, but I have to go and talk to them personally. Now, here's a little insight. I, now, I've done a number of coffee table books. You mentioned this goes on a coffee table. When I design my own books as well as do the writing and photography. So when I was designing this book, unlike the others, I said, you know, I want this to be big enough that you could put it on a coffee table and yet small enough that you could actually stick it on your toilet tank. So I made it about 20% smaller than my other books because the top of a toilet tank has a dimension. Right. And a coffee table book would not fit on there. No. So I don't know. It's a little quirky maybe to say that, but that that was where where my head was when I designed the size of the book. Actually, when I saw it, I thought it was very uh, in keeping with the times because everything is going to that kind of letterboxed format you know on uh in anything video so uh i i just can't compliment you enough how how long did it take you and how many places did you have to go to get all these photographs well when the idea occurred to me i had maybe six or seven photos that i'd taken over a long period of time 
it was just in the course of my travels, you know, I'd see this like totally amazing outhouse in a ghost town in Bodie, California. So I took that <laughs> picture many years ago. But the idea occurred to me when I was, uh, well, not important. I was, I was just kind of showing a bunch of people and I was getting a good reaction. I thought maybe I'll do a book. And that was about three years ago. And then it took me about two years and I traveled to, oh, maybe 30 states. And, and on my foreign travels, I, I would get bathroom pictures. There's no better conversation starter after the giggle. If you go up to somebody in a strange place, foreign country or this country, and whoever it is, and you say, you know, say you go to a bartender, uh, which I would do, and I'd say, any unusual bathrooms around here? And, of course, their first reaction is, you're pulling my leg, you know? But then you say, I'm a photographer, and I'm working on a book. And then they get totally engaged in a conversation with you. It, just, it comes out of nowhere, and it's so refreshing and surprising. So you can start up a conversation with anyone if that's your, your, opening, your opening line. So anyway, I worked on it for a couple of years. And then I just, it takes me a while to do the research and the writing and the design. So it's been out for a little while, and, and I've had a lot of other things kind of going on, and now I'm working on uh, marketing and talking to wonderful people in radio about the book. Well, I'll tell you what, it's, it's got my highest endorsement. I, I once, uh, passed in my journalism career, uh, came up with an idea for a story, which was to go into all the public buildings in Indianapolis, you know, restaurants, city county bill, everything that you could basically get to a bathroom and look at the graffiti. Now, I didn't photograph it. I probably should have. But I did do an article that was just things that people would write on bathroom walls, um, which which fascinated me. I can't imagine, uh, you know, with a big spectrum of places to go, you know, do, do you have like a, a, a wish list of places that you want to go but haven't? Oh, yes. <laughs> What's the number I did have, one? I did have kind of a wish list from. Well, speaking of graffiti, that was one of my most sought-after photographs, situations, you might say. And what I have found is when I was younger, there was graffiti everywhere. And usually it was in men's bathrooms anyway. It was pretty gross, you know, for a good time call. And yeah. then there were some, you know, some drawings on the wall bad and so on. Bad drawings. Pretty Very pretty god-awful. Yeah. Yeah, bad stuff. Crude, you know, really crude in every in every sense. But over the last, I don't know, at least decade, graffiti has almost been vanquished from bathrooms for a variety of reasons. It's not in good taste. They're making the walls a little bit harder to write on. Uh, they clean up walls after there is graffiti and so on. So it became like a quest. I was asking people all over, where is there a bathroom with, with graffiti? And lo and behold, you know, ask and ye shall receive. <laughs> Someone came to me and said, there is a bathroom near the inner harbor of Baltimore where the graffiti is so spectacular, they preserve it as if it's like art on the wall. And I went, uh, I drove there and, um, and I got permission to go in and it blew me away. There, there's graffiti from at least two or 300 people on that wall. Wow. And it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And, and you know, lighting it was a little bit of a challenge, I remember. But I knew when I walked in there, like, I had hit the mother load of graffiti. There could not be a better graffiti wall than that bathroom in Baltimore. Well, I'll tell you, I I agree with you. You don't see it as much anymore. You used to see it everywhere. And even if you were in a, a relatively nice place, you'd see nicer graffiti, maybe. But there was graffiti there. I speak at a lot of colleges and universities, and that's the only place I ever see it anymore. And it's really strange. The place they write it is in the grout of the tile because that's one of the few places – that you can, you know, you can't write on tile very easily. So they they put it in little letters on the, on the tile. 
but I miss graffiti. Good, gra- you know, insightful, in, you know, Good po- graffiti. politically yes. aware graffiti. Uh, when I did the article, a lot of the graffiti in the city county building was very politically centered. It wasn't nothing sexual, nothing gross. It was all, I, uh, you know, please flush after Senate Bill 103. You know, whatever, you know, it was, it was <laughs> or right. whatever. Uh, now, do that, you, that would have made that would have that would have made a good photo. D- do you have uh, a favorite bathroom of, of all the bathrooms you've been to? Is there one that just rises above the rest that, that you think is the it doesn't have to be the nicest or most opulent, just one that you think is the best? Well, um, let me let me rephrase it to say. Which one stands out in my mind the most? Uh, that I can answer. Best, there were so many great ones. You know, you mentioned right. the Las Vegas bathroom. That was great. But so was George Washington's outhouse. That blew me away, too. So but the most memorable was I, I found out about this when I gave one of my talks, and somebody came up and said, I know a guy, that kind of thing, <laughs> and he doesn't like you know, strangers going into the house and so on, but I know him. I'll call him for you if you want, and trust me, you won't be sorry. So I drove quite a few hours uh, in a little tiny town. He's outside of a town in northern New Jersey, and you go on a dirt road, and there's hardly anything there, and then all of a sudden you come across a house that's like out of a children's book, like a gingerbread castle-type house. And it was so unusual from the outside, so artistic. It was, um, you know, a very. It was like an art. An artist lives there, and he has created in his yard sculpture gardens and so on. And the house was fantastical. And so when I went in, each room had its own personality. And the bathroom was big, and he had done the tile work. He had done the stained glass. He had done the sculpture. I mean, this was his his kind of way of living. It was his work and his hobby. And he said, you know, take as much time as you want. And I spent hours and hours just finding different angles on this amazing bathroom. And I and I say in the book that I've been to every major, every one of the largest houses in America. You know, the Newport Mansions and the Biltmore Estate and in North Carolina, but those were made by teams of hundreds of people. This house was made by one man, and no house that I've ever been in is more amazing than this house. So that sticks out in my mind. And, you know, when you think of one person creating, like, a gigantic work of art, every room in the house is a work of art. So, uh, yeah, I just blew me away. And I say so in the book. Well, people are, I think, starting to get back to that build your own house and make it, you know, as awesome as they can. But but there are people that are so gifted, like the guy you're talking about, that uh, I, I love your analogy, that every single room is a work of art. Um, no. Do you do you got to no, I, I went to another. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, you you you. I, I was going to say something yeah. stupid. Yeah, I was you just going to say. I was going to say that there was one other bathroom that really caught my eye, and it was a guy uh, who is a pretty big-time real estate guy. So he had a lot of money. He's not – he has a lot of money. He's not particularly artistic himself, but he hired an artist to design a bathroom that is used by a company. You know, I think he gives a lot of parties. He could easily fit 150 people in his – in his living room. It's that kind of a house. And so the the bathroom that serves the you know services the guests is this bathroom created by an artist. And it is it is wild, kitschy. It's like everything I hate in a way in terms of the aesthetic of it because it just doesn't you know, there's styles of art, and this is not mine, but it was so over the top. It was so wild. It was so wonderful. I just wanted to sit on the can for hours and just stare at it. <laughs> I, mean, I, I never had that reaction in my whole life of, of seeing art that somehow I didn't think I would like, and yet 
it captivated me. Wow. And I don't know what it cost, but I would say this this must have been a easily a two to three hundred thousand dollar bathroom, and that would be wow. at the bottom end. Wow. Yeah. Uh, man. Uh, the the one in Vegas, that opulent, just spectacular. Oh, I I don't know if I could go in that bathroom. It's too nice. It, you know what I mean? There, yes, yes. There is a there is a feeling like it would be like going to the bathroom in a the room of a museum. Yeah, it, you know, it had that feeling. It had that feeling like an old Roman, uh, you know, bathroom from antiquity or something. And it was just fantastic. Uh, that ba- that bathroom I found through a completely a different route. There is a company that is involved in supplying bathrooms, and they run a contest, like a, a U.S. and Canadian Bathroom of the Year award. You know, they're contests for everything. <laughs> Americans are great at contests. You know, as soon as you get 10 people doing something, there's a contest to see who's the best. Right. So so this won a big prize in this uh, bathroom of the year uh, contest. And I was uh, flying out to Vegas, actually, to, to do a photo workshop. And I contacted the restaurant. And I said, uh, you know, I saw you, you, you won this big contest, and I'm working on this book. Well, of course, they said, sure, you know. <laughs> I mean, why would they have entered it in the contest? You know, they wanted to get some recognition. So uh, I think I took a particularly uh, a nice, a nice photograph. And there was a set, you know, a long set of urinals that could handle a lot of people at once. Now, the, the question would be that, that some people are curious about is, did I photograph ladies' bathrooms? Because I have a certain number of urinals and so forth. And the answer is yes, but then you have to have somebody guard the door. I don't just walk in quick and take a snapshot. You know, I <laughs> no. set up lights and I think it through. So I have to have a guard or I have to come in after hours, you know, before a restaurant opens, whatever. Uh, but I have a number of uh, ladies' rooms and I have one powder room from the Gilded Age. So oh, we're yeah. talking 1890s in an old hotel in Baltimore. And the powder room is is really just one part of the bathroom, but it is elegant beyond anything I've ever seen. I mean, just, you know, there are just amazing things out there. You just have to kind of look. You have to have an angle, you know, when you're traveling around. It's uh-huh. a big belief of mine. When you travel, if you just travel and you kind of do all the tourist things, you're getting a limited view. But, you know, you go to a city and you say, I just want to see bathrooms or whatever your angle is. And doors open up, and people are fascinated that you're interested in what they're interested in, and they want to take you there and show you around and have lunch with you, and and um, so that's the way I like to travel. Well, yeah, that's that's the only way to travel. Uh, I find yeah, it interesting yeah. that bathrooms are kind of designed in in this day and age for how long the people that own the bathroom want you to be there. Uh, if, if, if hmm. it's, if it's a work environment, man, it's pretty stripped down, you know, but if, if it is a really nice hotel or if it's a really nice, whatever, it's, it's a place where you want to be and you, you're, you know, you don't feel you're rushed. You're, you're actually comfortable and relaxed. It's uh, it's much more welcoming. Uh, yes. A, a lot of the, of the, Fancier hotels have taken this to heart now, and they are uh, putting bathrooms, situating them in in a room where there's a view, or they're putting you know certain specialized things in the bathroom, little jacuzzis or whatever, to make your bathroom experience as posh as the sleeping experience and the dining experience and the you know in their dining room. And it's a way of making a statement. And I can tell you that people, and I consider myself now a real authority on this, people really remember bathrooms. If if there's something unusual, it sticks in your head. That's how I had so many sources. You know, if I had said to people, if you've been to interesting, beautiful living rooms, let me know. I don't think I would have gotten the same reaction. People remember unusual bathrooms. Yeah. For whatever reason, but I think it's the whole kind of secret thing about bathrooms and uh, 
I don't know. There's some. There's, there's a lot of subconscious stuff going on there. Sure. Now, what's the best way for people to get this book? Uh, well, I, I wish I had had you before I got the blurbs on the book, you know, because you've you've given me some wonderful blurbs. But if you want to get it without Tom's blurbs, <laughs> uh, you can go to Amazon and just use two keywords, flush plus my last name is Gottlieb, G-O-T-T-L-I-E-B, be like boy. Or you could go to my website, GottliebPhoto.com. Actually, the website's under renovation today and tomorrow. But uh, anyway, Gottlieb Photo or, or Gottlieb Plus Flush. And the book is Flush, Celebrating Bathrooms Past and Present. And the book is amazing. You should immediately go out and get it. Uh, I will be putting blurbs on Amazon today. You know. Well, thank you. I can't. I can't get them on the book, but I. I will. There will be Amazon blurbs today. Seriously, this this book will will really really take you by surprise. And uh, if only for the photography alone, you would want this book. But but the subject, the way it's handled. And uh, the way you kind of jump from hardcore, this is what happened, to here's a little, I love the little side journeys that you took. Uh, yeah. partic- <laughs> partic- you know, the little the history a- of toilet paper, for example. Yes, yes. So uh, thank you so yeah. much for being here, Mr. Gottlieb. And everyone, please go out and get the book immediately. Thank you so much, Tom. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. The following is a public service announcement from The Tom Gully Show. Due to recent events, we are compelled to pass along this warning for listeners of The Tom Gully Show. Tragically, over the past few weeks, a pattern of alarming occurrences has befallen listeners who have failed to support the program via social media. For example, a Margaret D. from Indianapolis was struck down with chronic incurable sudden flatulence after ignoring an opportunity to like the Tom Gully Show Facebook page. Similarly, a Chuck L. of Richardson, Texas, was horrified to find that a sphincter opening had replaced his mouth after plagiarizing a Twitter posting from the show. A Marjorie H. of Tuscaloosa, Alabama, passed on a chance to join the TomGullyShow.com via Google+, and her dog, Mimsy, subsequently exploded. And both Zachary J. and Ted R. of Doylestown, Pennsylvania, sent nasty emails to Tom at the TomGullyShow.com and subsequently saw their genitalia blacken, shrivel, and fall off in the shower. Don't let this happen to you. Like the Tom Gully Show on Facebook, follow the show on Twitter at Atomic Palooka, and join and subscribe with links at the TomGullyShow.com. Email the program via Tom at the TomGullyShow.com, and when you do, good things will happen. Thank you. The preceding has been a public service announcement from the Tom Gully Show. I'd like to thank Steve Gottlieb for spending so much time in the bathroom and for creating the truly unique book, Flush, Celebrating Bathrooms Past and Present. It's on Amazon.com or go to Steve's own web. web, 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 web you, know. you know, that's the great part of the end of the show is I just do it and I don't edit it. And this is actually becoming one of the more popular. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, you can go to Steve's own website. Sorry, Mr. Godlieb, for screwing up. But see, people will remember it more now because they're waiting. Steve's own website, GottliebPhoto.com. And you spell that G-O-T-T-L-I-E-B-P-H-O-T-O.com. Gottlieb Photo. 
And uh, what a great guest. You guys got to go see this guy's photography. Go to that website, and several of his books are on display there. But I'm in love with this man's photography. Uh, Not only is he a gifted photographer, he's an artist in the sense that he really does seek out in journeys and travels all over the world very interesting thematic things to shoot, and he's just uh, uh, quite quite a photographer. Anyway, folks, we'd really appreciate it if you'd share this on your various Facebook pages. Trying to spread the word means trying to spread our little show here. I am continuing to get lots of mail about this part of the show. For the newer listeners, this part of the show used to be kind of a throwaway because I would read basically the same copy. I'd thank the guest... And then just read the same copy and never say anything else different. And people started uh, not listening to this part because it was the same all the time. And, and since then, I just sort of ramble. And for some reason, people enjoy that. Maybe I, I'm a suspe- suspecting that a lot of the listeners have tremendous amounts of free time, which clearly I do too, or I wouldn't be doing this. Um, where were we? I still have no idea why I get mail about this part of the show. Um, I, I also get a lot of hecklers and internet hatred as well. But I, I, I do get nice things about this part of the show. We'd appreciate it if you'd like the Tom Gully show. Not me, because who's going to do that? But the show, like the show on Facebook, too, if the mood strikes you. Of course, there's always the TomGullyShow.com. That's where you can find everything about the Tom Gully show. It's Tom Gully Show store, chock full of top quality name brand merchandise at bargain prices. Uh, you know, I'm, the next podcast we do is a live podcast uh, from the Whiskey Girl Saloon. I went there two bordering on three weeks ago. I have so much good stuff in that podcast. I want it to be a real gem because the Whiskey Girl Saloon in Fort Worth just kicks ass. And uh, so I've got so much good stuff. I'm trying to edit down to just brilliance. And that's the next podcast. Well, there's there. And I know that nobody's going to hear this that will tell them this. So I'll just go ahead and spill it. There are two bartenders there. One's named Leah. One's named Chelsea. And they are, are incredible. They are the best bartenders in Fort Worth. And I offered them free Tom Gully show ladies apparel free no charge and i have not heard back from them so just so you listeners know what i'm gonna do is like this weekend i'm gonna create an official special limited edition leah and chelsea line of tom gully show ladies apparel and i've already got it figured out what it's going to be for each one of them there's going to be a leah special limited edition t-shirt and there's going to be a chelsea one because that's what happened. That's what I do. That's just how vindictive I am. If if you turn down my free merch, then I torment you by creating special, you know, made in your image and honor apparel as revenge. And then they can't turn that down. And even if they do turn it down, then I just say, well, it doesn't matter if you turn it down because a whole bunch of other chicks are wearing it now. Ha 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 ha. I say, I always win. You know, that that's in, yeah, you know, it's not a big victory or a victory anybody else would ever want, you know, but I always find something that I manage uh, that I'm the winner. And you can always subscribe on iTunes for free because if it's free, it's for me. Tw- follow us on Twitter at Atomic Palooka as well. Got to tell you, I'm having so much fun following the Adult Film Star Network and their podcasts. And I don't care if you don't like adult films. This is a podcast that you would listen to on a morning show anytime. These two ladies, Rebecca Love and, and Jocelyn Stone, are hilarious. They recently did a show about NASCAR with comedian Daryl Wright, who is a NASCAR enthusiast and has his own NASCAR show. So it was a really serious show about NASCAR and it, hilarious. And uh, Twitter follow them, too, because I do a lot of Twittering back and forth with, with them. Um, Atomic Palooka. And, uh, you know, stop asking me why my Twitter handle is Atomic Palooka. I'll tell you someday. Just quit asking. Um Clout and cred. 
I had a bad experience with clout last week. My clout rating, and I mean in the middle of uh, the show, continues to spike. Uh, it just continues to get bigger and bigger. And in like the biggest show I've had in age ever, the biggest show ever, we dropped six clout points. And I wrote clout. And I'm like, why when my engagement is like quadruple what it's ever been, would, would this metric that, that raises up like maybe a quarter of a point, if you're lucky, in a day, why would it drop six points in a day? And they're like, well, it's uh, amalgamated on several different metrics and different um, you know, analytics that we're able to calibrate. And I'm like, you didn't tell me why, you know, I don't want you to tell me what's in the Kentucky Fried Chicken. I just want to tell you why I'm throwing up. Tell me why I'm throwing up. That's what I want to know. So incidentally, Rebecca Love admitted on her podcast, two of them, I, I think, and I'll find out because I'm going to go back and listen and I might put the clips on mine. This next one, Rebecca Love, Skinamax B Queen of late night television, admitted that she listens to my podcast on In the Shower. And I'm like, that. this isn't me bragging. This is me stunned that anybody, much less, you know, international sex symbol Rebecca Love would listen to my podcast in the shower. And I am bordering on being really annoying and scoreboarding people with that like crazy or just very humble and stunned like I am right now. So that'll do it for, wait a minute. Oh yeah. Uh, if, if we get enough new listeners this week, we're all going to go to the aces. That'll do it for tonight. I'm out of here. I got to go talk to some people. I'll talk to you much later each night. Jay Johnson brings us in with the truth wagon. He's out at love and war in Plano tonight with Matt Hillier, 1100 Springs. I was trying to get there, but I'm doing this. Um, and each night, oh wait, go to jjohnsonmusic.com, by the way. And each night, Jay Johnson, by the way, you'll, you'll be able to hear lots of his live performance with Mark LaFon and uh, Tom McElvain and the Dirty Pesos from the Whiskey Girl Saloon uh, on the next podcast. So jjohnsonmusic.com. And each night we take you out with... Russell, the Hitman Alexander, and the Hitman Blues Band. Go to hitmanbluesband.com or hitmanbluesband.net. They are, of course, my favorite blues band. And if you go to hitmanbluesband.net and sign up for their very tastefully not annoying email list, maybe once a month, maybe, more like once every two months, you get nine free blues songs from these cats. And you want these nine free blues songs badly. You badly want them. And then, because you got nine free, you can go and you can purchase some. See how that works? Because then, say you buy nine. You can say you got 18 for half price. You're still a bargain shopper. And we will see you next time. Well, the bucket lifts a twig for a dog that's nothing big, but he don't want to. And the dog can't grab a cat A raccoon can do all that But he don't want to And I dream of you at night While you hold your baby tight But he don't want you You can see it in his eyes From the way he tells you lies But he don't want you He's still